God's word here this morning in Matthew 2, 1 through 12. It says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may worship him. Wink, wink. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, The star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced. Come on, people, give me a rejoice. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and they worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you so much that we get to gather this Christmas. Lord, would you help us to focus on the main reason for this season? That's the coming of your son, Jesus. Help us to focus this morning. I know there's lots going on. I know I gave my kids snacks up here this morning. It looks like the barn up here. We may even have some smells coming in like a manger here this morning, and that is totally okay. We've got all the other stuff in our lives going on this morning, but we take this time this morning to focus on you, Jesus. You are our king. You are our king, and we declare that this morning. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Miss Jen, if you could go ahead and hit the lights back there, it'd be a, a huge blessing. We could see each other, or I could see you guys and all your beautiful faces. Last week, I said something that I've never said in church before. I said, you guys look absolutely horrific, because it was Ugly Sweater Sunday, and you guys had all your ugly sweaters, and you look so perfect. This week, you guys look incredible. You guys look so good. I just want to wish you guys a Merry Christmas. I have to say, for the longest time, Christmas has been um, kind of one of those chores for me. It's been like we we go through it, we get through it, but there's so much to get done. And and sometimes there's so many like difficult memories that come with this season. Uh, Let me tell you what. The Holy Spirit this year has brought me so much joy this Christmas, and I hope that it can overflow onto you a little bit. I don't care about what your circumstances are. I pray the joy of the Lord over you this Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Listen, we've coined this Christmas, the 2023 Christmas season, the season that changes everything. Because we believe at the core of this message of the Christmas time, of this Christmas gospel, if you will, is that God loved each of us so much that he sent his one and only son to pay the price for us. He came and lived this sinless life. He came as a baby during the season, lived this sinless life. He went to the cross. He paid the price for our sins. He went to the grave, but he rose again. And so we get to celebrate all of this. Listen, there is a God who came to earth to change your whole world. But guess what? He didn't stop there. It wasn't just a one-time event. Our God keeps doing this. Our God keeps changing our world. He hasn't stopped 
It was just several years ago, actually, during one of our Christmas services where I got to share this video of this testimony of my sister who was a heroin addict and on the streets and Jesus Christ saved her. Jesus Christ transformed her life. You guys have heard the story of of me coming from a a violent person, a person who was in jail, a person who was also a drug addict, changed by the power of Jesus. This stuff is still happening today. I remember last week, or a couple weeks back, Pastor Neek, Pastor Neek, can I call you Pastor Neek? (laughs) Pastor Neek, hey! (laughs) Pastor Nick is how we say it here at Rise Church. Pastor Nick shared a couple weeks ago and he said that your greatness is not defined by the circumstances that are around you. You guys remember this message? It's so good because as we look around the world around us today, we recognize these circumstances are not so great, right? There are things going on in the world around us that are not so great, but it isn't your circumstances and what's around you that defines your greatness. What defines your greatness is what's inside of you. Someone, is God inside of you? Come on, yes, it's God in Christ and me. This is the Christmas season. We get to celebrate this. Listen, God has willed to show his glory, not just to you, but through you. Through your life, God wants to show his glory to the rest of the world. This is another something to celebrate. But as we just talk about Christmas, I want you to consider just for a few moments here, what are your favorite things of the Christmas season? And just begin to maybe make a mental list. What are your favorite things of the Christmas season? And not just your church answers. Come on. <laughs> your real answers. What are, what are they? Where, what do they fall on your, on your list? Is it raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens? Bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens? Brown paper packages tied up with strings? These are a few of my favorite things. Listen, if, come on now, y'all can give me a jump for that. Woo! Listen, I know if we're truly honest, and remember, you have to be honest because you are sitting in church this morning, (laughs) that on your list is gifts. Among your favorite things of Christmas are the presents, are the gifts that we give and the gifts that we receive. And there are so many different types of gifts. There are those ones that come in the huge boxes. You know the ones that you look at and you're like, whoa, I hope that's my present. (laughs) You've got those gifts that don't come out until the last minute. I love those ones. When you think everything's all done and then they, those come out. You've got the gifts that are so tiny that they don't catch your eye until the la- very last minute. And you look at it and you thought all the gifts were done and you looked at oh, there's one more. There's one more. Yes. You've got those gifts that go bang and make everybody say, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. You've got those gifts that ke- you can't keep wrapped up too long because they're bouncing around and they're wiggling out of the, out of the wrapping paper. You've got those gifts that go vroom, vroom, or those gifts that go vroom. You've got those gifts that help everybody to match. I don't see anybody here wearing the matching stuff quite yet, but I bet they're coming out this evening, those matching pajamas. Here's the thing about gifts, though. The, the gift, if given well, reflect the recipient of the gift. So the gift says something or some things about the person who is receiving those those gifts. And so the person whose gift that goes bang, we would expect that the person receiving that gift likes to shoot, likes to go hunt, yeah? The person that gets the gift that goes vroom is often because they're the one who's always asking for rides, Right? They're the one who are like really trusty in the parental chauffeur at that time. Right? Like, so they're the ones who get that type of gift. Those people who get the gifts with the little animals that wriggle, wriggle out, it, it's because they love animals. Right? So the gifts, if they're given well, reflect the recipient of the gift. And so I wonder what we could learn this Christmas about the gifts that were given to Jesus. What do his gifts say about him? But first... Let's look at those who gave the gifts. In the story, we read this. It says, In the days of King Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east. It's interesting, the facts that the Bible gives us. 
I would expect, you know, maybe hair color, maybe hair length, maybe eye color, maybe what they were wearing, maybe their names. No, but here's what we received. Wise men from the east, but we can actually get a lot of information from that. Some con- um, uh, uh, translations of the Bible may say magi from the east. Here's some facts that we can understand from this. I want to take you back to an Old Testament story. There's a story that uh, is told um, that goes something along the lines of the dude was thrown into a den with a bunch of lions. Someone make a roar. Roar. Thrown in with a bunch of lions. This was Daniel. Daniel was a really smart young man from the people of Israel. And the people of Israel were God's people. God came in, looked at all of the people of the earth. He goes down to Israel and says, you're going to be my people, and I am going to be your God. This is awesome, but here's what this requires. If you are going to be my people, and I am going to be your God, you need to follow the directions that I'm giving you. You need to live in a specific way, because I want you to be an example to the rest of the world on what it looks like to be a follower of God, right? And so, God gives these directions, and the people of Israel say, yeah, we'll do that. We will be your people. You will be our God. We will follow your directions. But what happened? They didn't follow. They didn't obey. And when there are things that we step outside of God's desire for our life, there are consequences. You guys ever experienced consequences in your life? My kids are like, yeah, yeah, we totally get consequences. Yes, we know there are, there are consequences. So the people of Israel did receive consequences, and God told them specifically what those consequences were going to be. He said, there will be people who come into your land and take you away to a different land. And so that's exactly what took place. Even though God warned them time and time again, they kept doing what they were doing. Babylon is one of those places that we begin to see in the Bible this people coming in and taking force and removing the people of Israel and bringing them back to their land. And guess what? Babylon is one of the places where we begin to see this idea of wise men or magi as it would be. So we're talking 600-ish years before the birth of baby Jesus in that manger with all the animals. Someone make an animal sound for me. Nah, I don't even know. Like, yeah. (laughs) No, that's wrong. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. But we read this story of the Assyrians. Okay, enough animal sounds. There we go. We see in the story, though, we remember during this time period, you've got Daniel, you've got his other young friends. They were Hananiah, Misael, and Azariah. They refused to worship these false gods of this of this country. And they were punished for it. They were thrown into a fire. They were thrown into a lion's den. But because God's spirit was with them and protecting them and empowering them, they all survived. Now, in this same storyline right here in this Bible, we have a group of people called the wise men or the magi that we are introduced to. The word in the New Testament, the Greek word is magos or mageo or magai. Um, It's simply the name of this certain group of of people. There were these magi, and they were this priestly line, this priestly tribe of people coming from this group of people called the Medes. And they were very skilled in astronomy and astrology, and so they looked at all the stars. Anybody like looking at stars? Looking at the stars and the constellations, and then they began to do something a little bit more. They began to get like think about interpretations of what could this mean that the stars are doing this and the stars are shifting this? How could that be affecting us? This is something called astrology. And so they began to get into kind of what people would refer to as like magic and sorcery and things, things of, of this nature, which is actually where we get the term today for the word magic from these people, these magi. And these, these Medes or these Magi were sort of a knockoff from the people of Israel. They had a lot of similarities to the people of Isra- Israel. There was an ancient historian called Herodotus, and he said that the Magi were a tribe of hereditary priests within a larger tribe of people called 
the means. And these priests could do magical or supernatural things. Very similar to the people of Israel, right? So the people of Israel had 12 tribes. And of the 12 tribes, there was one group, one tribe called the Levites. And they were called to be the priestly line. And so you have this set up from God, the way that he's choosing to build his kingdom, and now you have a knockoff taking place where these people can do similar things. It looks just like that. And now we jump back into the story of Daniel, and we see that Daniel rises above all of the other people during that time and is put amongst the leaders of these magi. He gets to begin to speak into them some, some wisdom, some true wisdom of, of God. He's placed in this, this place of power. And so just to reframe this literally so we can get this, there's a counterfeit religion that's mimicking the design that God has put fl- place for the Israelites. And it puts Daniel in, the, in this tremendous situation where he's able to now begin to impact this group of people to begin to flip the script, to begin to flip what is evil and turn it for, for good. Isn't that just like our God? To take what's evil, to take what the enemy is meant for evil and turn it for, for good. Like, as I look across the room this morning, I truly believe that God is doing that story in each of you, that God is taking some things that have been birthed out of evil places, that have been... Uh, uh, found in a place where the enemy wants to take you out, wants to put you in pain, wants you to feel negative things, and God is using it for good. I believe that this morning. But as we think about this group, this magi, this group of wise men, they held their control from that time of Daniel all the way through up until this time of Jesus to the point where they were at this point now known as kingmakers. They had the power to set up new kings, and if they didn't like a king, they could take a king down. They could take him, they could take him out. And so we fast forward 600 years now to the story of Jesus' birth in Matthew chapter 2, and the world is in this big upset. We've seen ruling powers, different groups of people, different countries having ownership and having rulership over all of the other people. And by this point, there are two big powers. The first power is Rome. Someone say Rome. Rome. Rome Rome was a huge ruling power at this time. The only other group that was nearly as powerful as them was the Persian Parthian Empire. And the only reason these two groups weren't fighting at this time because they had a little piece of paper, a little treaty that says, we're not going to fight. And so at this time where Jesus is born, um, in this eastern empire of this Persian Parthian empire, there was a group ruling over this, uh, this group of people called the Magistanes. And they were totally composed of people called Magi whose duty was to have absolute choice in the selection over the king. And so come into this story with me. Like, check, check this out. You have these magi coming in. They're riding into town. They're a, there's this desire in the east to overtake Rome. There's this desire now to see uh, uh, some other king come and rise into place. And so when we read in Matthew 2, 3, it says... When, well, my notes say Harold the king, um, but when Herod the king heard, uh, heard this, that he, he, was, he was troubled. And so as we step back into the story, we recognize that he wasn't troubled because there was a baby being born. It was something more. It was something deeper. The Greek word here that's used for troubled is for it to mean agitated. Like he was literally like shaking. Kids, have you ever seen or made your parents so mad that you've seen them like shake? No, of course, you've you've never do something like that. Not the children of Rise Church, let me tell you this. No, no. But that's that's how freaking out, that's how troubled that he he was. He had heard that these oriental Parthian, uh, Parthian kingmakers had arrived to Jerusalem. They've come in with the Persian cavalry. And he was troubled. They said to him, where's the one who is called the king of the Jews? 
They're asking this question. Someone say, King of the Jews. King of the Jews. Here's the thing. Caesar Augustus had actually given that name to Herod, the king of the Jews. And so he was like, I'm right here. What do you mean? The king of the Jews is right here. But they were looking for this, this other king. We're coming to find this new king. And so the Magi inform Herod of their intentions. They say, where's this one who's been born? The king of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And this is when we get to the, the story where we get to these treasures being opened up to Jesus. And I want you to know that they saw something more than a baby in that moment. They saw a king. They saw something even more than a king. Listen, at this point, they had heard from the story of Daniel for hundreds of years these magi had begun to anticipate this king actually coming. Catch how powerful this is, guys, because here in Matthew, we see these magi, a group designed specifically by Satan to be a pagan counterfeit to the priesthood that mocked and perverted true godly worship. And now they are bowing down and worshiping Jesus Christ, the anointed one. And listen, the gift, if given well, reflect the recipient of the gift. The gift says something or some things about the person who's getting the gift. So let's look very quickly at those gifts. Worship team, if you guys can come up, we'll get back to singing here in just a moment. Let's think about these gifts. This first gift, this first gift was gold. Now, as you looked around society at that time, It wasn't for the lowly. It wasn't for the poor to have these bits of of gold. It wasn't even for the well-off to have gold. It was for kings. Gold was set aside for kings. This wasn't just a baby. This gift says this is a king. The second gift was frankincense. Frankincense is a resin that comes from an African tree. It's extremely fragrant, and it's traditionally used to be burned in an act of worship unto God. This gift was to say, this is not just a baby. This is not just a king. This is God. This is God coming down to be with his people. This is God. And the third was myrrh. Myrrh was a very valuable substance. It was gummy in consistency. It was also harvested from trees. It was used for narcotic pain relievers. It was offered to Jesus on the cross, and he refused it. Myrrh is also mentioned as a rare perfume used to anoint the high priest in Exodus. Myrrh is also used in the embalming process and purification in the process of the dead. So not only is this not just a baby, this is a king. Not only is this just a king, this is God. Not only is this God, but this is our high priest and the ultimate sacrifice for mankind. The prophetic nature of these gifts is so powerful. How these gifts would tell the future of the salvation of all who would believe. It's incredible. Gold for a king frankincense for a God, myrrh for the high priest and final sacrificial death of the lamb. All from magi who were originally a counterfeit Levitical priesthood. But now instead of counterfeit gifts being given to a counterfeit God, we see gifts given to the one true God because no counterfeit is bigger or stronger than God's ultimate design. This Christmas, the power of God is present in inviting you to uncounterfeit your life. Across the globe, there are counterfeit religions dictating different accumulative acts to earn salvation. Somehow I'm going to do enough that I'm going to earn my salvation. It's time to uncounterfeit salvation. 
the Bible, the word of God says that salvation is by grace, through faith, through Christ alone. It's a gift given to you that you must believe in and it comes through Jesus Christ alone. There is no other way to eternal life. There is no other way to salvation. By grace, through faith, in Christ alone. We see a lot out there about counterfeit faith. Maybe some of us have even been touched by counterfeit faith where you can earn your healing somehow. It's time to uncounterfeit it. The Bible says, Jesus says, by my stripes you are healed. When did those stripes take place? Long time ago. By my stripes you are healed. The Bible also says, when you confess your sins one to another, you are forgiven. We've been touched by some counterfeit faith We've been touched by some counterfeit religious systems. Listen, I am proof that you can have a past in counterfeit religion that builds upon the Bible, but also says you must have some other understandings in order to fully understand the Bible. Listen, let me just say this very clearly. If it's not in the Bible, it's not of God. If it's not in the Bible, it's not of God. Some of us have been, many of us, most of us, if not all of us, have been touched by counterfeit love. Whether deep relationships on the marital side of things or deep friendships, we've experienced counterfeit love. We felt used, we felt manipulated, we felt deeply unrepairable. But listen, there is no counterfeit bigger or stronger than God. If God can take a counterfeit priesthood, build hope and faith in a Messiah over 600 years. Cause them, listen y'all, cause them to follow a shooting star and to find a treasure in a barn. If that is true, Disney fairy tales ain't got nothing on this God. This is amazing. And I just want to invite us, Christmas is something that we get to step into Christmas is something that we get to step into in action with our lives, that we get to do something with. It's no longer just a day. This is a day that we could make real. And so listen, if this is your day, if this is your year to overcome a counterfeit, go ahead and stand up to your feet with me. If you need to renounce and step away from some counterfeits in your life, go ahead and stand to your feet with me. If you want to claim victory over this year in the name of Jesus, go ahead and stand to your feet with me. If you want to declare Jesus as the God of your life, go ahead and stand to your feet with me. I've got a prayer that we're going to say together just up on the screen. You're welcome to read it with me. It says, Jesus, I declare... You are the one true God and the one true way to eternal life. I close the door to all counterfeit beliefs, to all counterfeit experiences, and to all counterfeit actions. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me with your presence, forgiving me of all my sins, making me a new creation. You are the one true authentic God. I give my life fully and completely to you. And Jesus, I declare that you are what I celebrate this Christmas. Yes. All across this room, on the count of three, I want you to shoot your hand in the air if this was your first time ever doing something like that. And on the count of three, when people shoot their hands up, we're going to all scream at the top of our lungs with a huge shout of praise. One, two, three. Woo! Listen, outside of gifts, one of my favorite things about Christmas is this right here fire baby (laughs) give me fire I love fire and it reminds us that the light of Jesus came into this world and it's a light that is still burning inside of me inside of all of us so here's what we're going to do we're going to go into our candle lighting time and I want to start primarily with the people here on the inside if you didn't grab a candle and you still need one Uh, We still have some in the foyer, yeah? Okay, so everyone get your candles out. 
For those people on the inside of the aisle, if you could come up and light your candle first. And then here's the deal. Candles, fires, stay straight up. Okay, as we're walking, we need the shield of faith. Okay, that's going to block the wind. And then we're going to go back to our row. And then we're going to light the next person and the next person and the next person. Does that make sense? Parents, did I say that in a safe enough fashion? Okay, people on the ends in the, in the center of these aisles, if you guys would come here, come first.
While shepherds kept their watching O'er silent flocks by night Behold, throughout the heavens There shone a holy light Oh, I'll see the Telling on the Over the hills and everywhere go Tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Down in a lowly manger Our humble Christ was born And God sent us salvation On that blessed Christmas morn Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills Jesus Christ is born. I was a lonely seeker. I sought both night and day. I asked the Lord to help me, and He showed me a way. Oh, tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. I said, go and tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That Jesus Christ is born. That Jesus Christ is born. out let's go ahead and sing one more final song together we wish you a merry christmas we wish you a merry christmas we wish you a merry christmas and a happy new year hey listen real quick here comes santa claus here comes santa claus we do have santa visiting if you want to take pictures from us as the Rise family, we just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Please join us next door for some holiday cookies. We sure do love you guys. Merry Christmas. <laughs>